tonight. Another way out? The US proposes an alternative draft to the temporary ceasefire deals. Hopes high for a potential breakthrough in talks to put a pause on the bloodshed. Marching on. Talks between farmers in India and government authorities fall through as the group prepare to continue their walk to Delhi to demand a fair deal. On the brink. Taiwan and China see tensions rise at the border islands of Kinmen following an increase of security from Chinese forces. The move threatening the fragile calm between the two nations. And strutting your stuff. London Fashion Week's Kat Stravaganza sees feline fashion icons take to the runway to teach the models the true essence of a catwalk. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Vedana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening. You're joining us on World News this lovely Tuesday night. Hope it has been a productive day for you so far. We have a lot to catch you up on tonight and we continue to lead with updates on the Israel-Palestine conflict. The United States has proposed an alternative draft United Nations Security Council resolution. It calls for a temporary ceasefire in the Israel-Hamas war and opposes a major Israeli ground offensive in Rafah in southern Gaza. Washington has been averse to the word ceasefire in any UN action on the Israel-Hamas war. However, the U.S. draft text echoes language that President Joe Biden said he used last week in conversations with Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Israel plans to storm Rafah, where more than one million Palestinians are sheltering, prompting international concern. It was not immediately clear if or when the draft resolution would be put to a vote. The U.S. put forward the text after Algeria requested the Council vote Tuesday on its draft resolution. Algeria is demanding an immediate humanitarian ceasefire in the Israel-Hamas war. U.S. Ambassador to the UN Linda Thomas-Greenfield quickly signaled that it would be vetoed and said the initial draft resolution could jeopardize, quote, sensitive negotiations on hostages. A resolution needs at least nine votes in favor and no vetoes by the United States, France, Britain, Russia or China to be adopted. Protesting Indian farmers now say that they will resume marching to the capital Delhi this week after rejecting a government proposal to buy some crops at assured prices on a five-year contract. The protesters began marching last week but were stopped around 200 kilometers from Delhi. And since then, farmer leaders have been in talks with the government on their demands. But just last night, they said that the offer was not in their interest. The government had proposed buying pulses, maize and cotton at guaranteed floor prices, also known as minimum support price or MSP, through cooperatives for five years. But the farmers say they will stand by their demand of a legal guarantee for MSP on all 23 crops. Union leaders said they appeal to the government to either resolve the issues or remove barricades and allow them to proceed to Delhi to protest peacefully. They say they will resume marching from Wednesday. Farmers form an influential voting bloc in India and analysts say the government of Prime Minister Narendra Modi will be keen not to anger or alienate them. His Bharatiya Janata Party is seeking a third consecutive term in power in general elections this year. We're moving over now to Indonesia, where tragedy has struck the nation as at least 71 election workers have died from exhaustion since the world's largest single day election was held in Indonesia last week. This is actually not the first instance of mass deaths caused by the elections in the nation. The chairman of the nation's polling body said on Monday that some 4,000 other election workers had taken ill since the February 14th election due to fatigue from helping to run the national event. Five million paid volunteers worked at some 800,000 polling stations to host the more than 200 million citizens who had registered to cast their votes. While voting lasted for about six hours, the post-vote distribution, counting and reporting of paper ballots in some cases lasted over 12 hours. The government had imposed an age cap and mandatory health checks for volunteers after over 500 polling station workers died following the 2019 Indonesian election. 
still in the region now, Taiwan has accused China's Coast Guard of triggering panic after six Chinese officials briefly boarded a Taiwanese tourist boat. They checked the ship's route plan, certificate and crew licenses and left just half an hour later. It comes less than a week after Chinese fishing boats that were pursued by Taiwan's Coast Guard in the same area. The boat later capsized, killing two. Beijing later said it would step up patrols in the Kinmen Archipelago. Kinmen lies just three kilometers away from China's southeastern coast, placing it on the front line of tensions between China and Taiwan. China is increasing patrols in waters near a group of frontline islands controlled by Taiwan. China's Coast Guard said its Fujian Division will strengthen maritime law enforcement and carry out regular patrols in waters around the Chinese city of Xiamen and Taiwan's Kinmen Islands. The move is aimed at further maintaining the order of operations in the relevant waters and protecting lives and property of fishermen. Patrols are likely to put Chinese Coast Guard vessels in closer proximity to their Taiwanese counterparts, potentially raising the risk of miscalculation and conflict. Nearly two years since the war in Ukraine began, the IAEA and Ukrainian officials are increasingly worried that the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, the largest in Europe, could be on the brink. Two years on, the International Atomic Energy Agency, which has inspectors at the plant, is sounding the alarm. It's the most dangerous situation that we have. It's my job not to, uh, you know, so panic, but at the same time, I have to tell the truth of what is happening. Nuclear experts point to three main dangers. First, a military strike on the plant, either accidental or deliberate. Second, a power cut. The plant's six uranium reactors require electricity for cooling. But Ukrainian officials say three of the four power lines are damaged, and the fourth is faulty. There have already been eight blackouts, as recently as December. When you have a blackout, the cooling function of the reactors is lost, and you could have a, a meltdown. And finally, it's understaffed. Ukrainians say the Russians have been abusing employees. 11,000 people worked at the plant before, only 4,000 work there now. Let's go for a short commercial break. We'll be right back with updates on the South Carolina primaries and other key stories and much more. Stay tuned. Welcome back. U.S. President Joe Biden has said that he is willing to meet with Republican House Speaker Mike Johnson to discuss the funding bill for Ukraine. He said that he'd be happy to meet him if he was wanting to say anything. Speaking to reporters as he returned to the White House now from a weekend in Delaware, Biden added that Republicans are making a big mistake by opposing aid to Ukraine for use in its war to repel Russian invaders. Earlier this month, the U.S. Senate passed a $95 billion aid package in a bipartisan vote. It includes funds for Ukraine, but Johnson so far has declined even to bring it up for a vote on the floor of the House, which Republicans control by a narrow margin. Meanwhile, Johnson has been demanding a meeting with Biden. The idea that we're going to let NATO begin to split is totally against the interest of the United States. Biden has been sharply critical of his likely election rival Donald Trump, and other Republicans for threatening to not defend NATO allies. He blamed the death of Alexei Navalny on Russian President Vladimir Putin last week. Biden said he hoped the death of the Russian opposition leader would spur Republicans to support the aid for Ukraine. Congress is not due back in Washington until February 28th. And now on the road to the White House, with the South Carolina primaries less than a week away, Nikki Haley is facing a polling deficit of more than 30 points in a state where she once served as governor. She said she's taking the campaign against former President Trump one state at a time. It's a tall order for Haley as South Carolina prepares to vote on Saturday. Trump's 2016 primary win helped cement his frontrunner status, and he boasts support from all of the state's top elected leaders, and all but one of its congressional Republicans. 
trailing Donald Trump by more than 30 points in her home state, former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley is plowing on. At the end of the day, we want to close that gap. We want to make sure that we continue to show that there's a purpose there. We're playing all of them. You'll have, you know, after South Carolina, you're going to have another 20 states vote. Only three states have voted. We don't anoint kings here. One state at a time. One state at a time. If we, if I were to get out of the race now, it would be the longest general election in history. The political elite are saying you should get out. Why? Why should I get out? Do we not want states to vote? Let's let them vote. A win in South Carolina on Saturday would give Trump his fourth state victory in a row. Facing that prospect, Haley is focusing her campaign speeches here on the former president's mounting legal challenges and his posture toward Russia. Do that. I don't know why he keeps getting weak in the knees when it comes to Russia, but I'll tell you what, Russia's not getting weak in the knees. Trump made his first comments about the death of Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny in a Truth Social post Monday, connecting it to his own legal woes, saying we are a nation in decline. Now for some defense updates, Australia has announced a decade-long plan to double its fleet of warships and boost its defense spending by an additional 11.1 billion Australian dollars. Defense Minister Richard Marl said that the government's plan would eventually increase the Navy's surface combatant fleet to 26 from 11, the largest since the end of the World War. For more on this, we have other there in the World News Special Correspondent Binet Sanratta from Melbourne in Australia. For more, Binet. Yes, I'm Ravi. He cited concerns over rising geopolitical tensions as competition between the United States, its allies and China heats up in the Asian Pacific region. Under the new plans, Mars said Australia will get six hunter-class frigates, 11 general-purpose frigates, three air warfare destroyers and six state-of-the-art surface warships that do not need to be crewed. The vessels could be inducted by the mid-2030s. The announcement, which comes amid Australian plans to procure at least three US-designed nuclear-powered submarines, would see Canberra increase its defence spending to 2.4% of gross domestic product above the 2% target set by its NATO allies. But the country's major defence project has long been beset by cost overruns, government U-turns, policy changes and project plans that make more sense for local job creation than defence. Officials said that the government must overcome past errors and had no more time to waste as competition in the region heats up. Back to you, Anuravi. All right, thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent, Binet Severnatha from Melbourne in Australia. More than 1,600 trainee doctors in South Korea's major hospitals have staged a walkout. They're protesting a government plan to admit more students to medical schools, which they argue could lead to unnecessary medical procedures and undermine the finances of the National Health Insurance Plan. Representatives for the doctors held an emergency in the capital Seoul to discuss what to do next, though their agenda so far is unclear. On Tuesday, health officials confirmed that nearly half of the country's 13,000 doctors and interns at large hospitals had handed in resignations, and around a quarter of them had left their workplaces. The second vice health minister said there had already been 34 cases where the walkout had affected medical procedures, including 25 cancellations. Currently, around 3,000 people are admitted to medical school every year in South Korea. However, the plan the trainees are protesting would boost admissions by 2,000 starting in the 2025 academic year, eventually hitting 10,000 more in a decade's time. South Korea had only 2.6 doctors per 1,000 people in 2022, far below average for countries in the OECD. It sparked worry over an acute shortage of doctors for pediatrics, emergency units and clinics outside the greater Seoul area. A recent Gallup Korea poll showed over three quarters of South Koreans back the plan for more medical students. Meanwhile, Tuesday's walkout has presented a real threat of delays to surgical operations and patient treatment. The prime minister pleaded with doctors to not, quote, hold the lives and health of the people hostage and ordered emergency measures, including more telemedicine, more operations at public hospitals and opening up military clinics. Now, according to a statement from the Houthis' military spokesperson Yahya Saraya, Yemen's Houthi-targeted British registered cargo ships Rubima in the Gulf of Aden, and it's now at risk of sinking. 
وكان من نتائج العملية ما يلي إصابة السفينة The results of the operation are as follows. The ship was severely damaged, leading to its complete halt. Due to the significant damage suffered by the ship, it is now at risk of sinking in the Gulf of Aden. We took care during the operation to ensure the safe evacuation of the ship's crew. The Houthis had also shot down a US drone in the port city of Hodeida, he said. British maritime security firm Ambray separately confirmed that the Belize-flagged, UK-registered and Lebanese-operated general cargo ship came under attack on Sunday in the Bab al-Mandab Strait off Yemen. The UK Maritime Trade Operations Agency also reported on Sunday that the crew had abandoned a ship off Yemen after an explosion, apparently the same incident. It said that military authorities confirmed that the vessel was at anchor and all the crew were safe. In what Houthis say is an effort to support Palestinians in the war between Israel and Hamas militants in the Gaza Strip, they have made repeated drone and missile attacks against international commercial shipping in the Red Sea and the Bab al-Mandab Strait, a route that accounts for about 12% of the world's shipping traffic. Ambry said the ship was heading north during its journey from the United Arab Emirates to Bulgaria when the attack occurred. The attacks have prompted several companies to halt Red Sea voyages and take a longer and more expensive route around Africa. US and British warplanes have carried out retaliatory strikes across Yemen. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. A camera could save multiple lives. Australian safety regulators want driver distraction cameras installed in every truck and car on Australian roads. It's claimed the technology has helped avoid nearly half a million crashes over the past year. David Ide is in his truck up to 80 hours a week, watched at every moment by a special camera. It's always working, all times. When you're working, it's working. And waiting to act at the first sign of trouble. There we go. That's all it does. That alert triggered by the tiny infrared sensor that's tracking the face, the eyes and the body. And it's been heading off more than a thousand high-risk incidents a day, including 131,000 confirmed moments of drowsiness or microsleep and 55,000 instances of mobile phone use. It's in 25,000 vehicles nationwide, and Cube Group's been using it for several years and safer. And finally tonight, let's all go to London Fashion Week, where the catwalk took on a literal meaning at the Loving Cat Worldwide's Cat Stravaganza show. Felines took centre stage at London's Olympia, with the UK's most lavish pampered cats carried down the runway by their owners. Stephen Masserve, the founder of Loving Cats Worldwide, said that while the event took place during London Fashion Week, stating, we have our own catwalk here and our models are way cuter. Cat extravaganza shows are also heading to countries including Canada, Colombia and Japan, as well as cities in the US and the UK. The Real Catwalk. Models watch and learn. Well, that's all the stories we have for you this lovely Tuesday night. We'll see you again tomorrow with more updates on the happenings of the world. See you next time. Good night.